Welcome to the CAA International English for Aviation Language Testing System. The English for Aviation Language Testing System comprises the ICAO Expert Level 6 Assessment and the English for Aviation Language Test. The ICAO Expert Level 6 Assessment, or ICAO ELSA, is designed for the confirmation of ICAO Expert Level 6 language proficiency of native or near-native speakers of English. The English for Aviation Language Test, or EALT, is designed for the assessment of language proficiency of non-native speakers of English. Within this system, the EALT itself comprises two tests, the EALT test of listening and the EALT test of speaking. This is a presentation of the EALT test of speaking. The EALT test of speaking assesses plain English language in the context of aviation against the criteria contained in the ICAO holistic descriptors of operational language proficiency and across the continuum of language proficiency described in the six-band ICAO language proficiency rating scale, from ICAO pre-elementary level one to ICAO expert level six. There is no pass or fail in the EALT, but of course the aim of candidates would be to demonstrate proficiency in each of the five ICAO holistic descriptors and to achieve a rating of ICAO level four or above. To achieve a level four rating, candidates must demonstrate an overall operational command of spoken English. To achieve a level five rating, candidates must demonstrate an overall extended command of spoken English. And to achieve a level six rating, candidates must demonstrate an overall expert command of spoken English. Before you watch a sample of the EALT test of speaking, I'd like to tell you more about it. The CAA International EALT test of speaking is a direct face-to-face -face interview for the purposes of assessing a candidate's use of spoken English in the context of aviation by means of a series of exchanges or language tasks. Typically, candidates take the test in pairs. They may know each other, or they may never have met before. If there is an uneven number of candidates taking the test in any one sitting, then a test interview will be held with a single candidate. The EALT test of speaking offers candidates the opportunity to demonstrate in a controlled but unthreatening environment their ability to communicate directly and effectively in spoken English. There are two examiners, an interlocutor and an assessor. The interlocutor conducts the test, asks the questions, instructs the candidates and sets the tasks. This examiner gives a separate global assessment of each candidate's performance. The assessor does not take part in the interaction, but focuses solely on observing the performance of the candidates and making a separate analytical assessment of each candidate's oral proficiency. According to their own area of expertise, the examiners may assess against the criteria of the ICAO language proficiency rating scale in the case of assessors with language specialist expertise, or the criteria of the ICAO holistic descriptors of language proficiency in the case of assessors with aviation operational expertise. Candidates are assessed independently of each other's performance. The interview lasts approximately 18 to 20 minutes and is recorded. There is a test introduction followed by three distinct stages or tasks. The test includes elements of both face-to-face -face and voice-only communication. The tasks are adaptable, allowing them to be customized to the particular aviation-related environment of individual candidates, both pilots and air traffic controllers. In this way, a unique test is created for every candidate. Each of the tasks facilitates a different type of interaction between the interlocutor and the candidate, between the two candidates face-to-face, between the two candidates in a voice-only exchange, and between the two candidates and the interlocutor together. The patterns of discourse and the linguistic demands on the candidates vary with the tasks of the test, with the candidate's performance being assessed in each of the different tasks, leading to the award of a final overall rating. Typically, the candidate will be asked to demonstrate proficiency in English in a variety of language operations, in the four functional language domains of triggering actions, sharing information, managing the speaker-listener relation, and managing the dialogue. Candidates are assessed for the intelligibility of their pronunciation in English, their range and accuracy in use of grammatical structures, their range and accuracy in use of vocabulary, their fluency, their comprehension as measured by their ability to speak and understand, 
and their overall ability to cope with the interaction. Throughout the three stages of the test, candidates are holistically assessed against their ability to communicate effectively in voice only and in face-to-face -face situations, communicate on common, concrete and work-related topics with accuracy and clarity, use appropriate communicative strategies to exchange messages and to recognize and resolve misunderstandings in a general or work-related context, handle successfully and with relative ease the linguistic challenges presented by a complication or unexpected turn of events that occurs within the context of a routine work situation or communicative task with which they are otherwise familiar, and use a dialect or accent which is intelligible to the aeronautical community. The e out test of speaking does not assess phraseology, and neither does it assess operational skills or specific technical knowledge of operations. It assesses only the candidate's proficiency in plain English in the context of aviation. Let's now watch the start of the interview. At his or her discretion, the interlocutor may ask the candidates to participate in a discussion of a more abstract nature, based on verbal questions thematically linked to task three scenarios. In the task three extended, candidates are given an opportunity to show that they are capable of discussing issues in greater depth. So in your scenarios, you spoke about non-routine situations. Um, these situations would be stressful for everyone involved, including those people on the flight deck and in the control tower. So how do you think people respond to those situations? At the beginning of the emergency, the uh, pilots have, have a lot to do. Uh, checklist and ide uh, identifying the problem. So, yeah, and then the controller needs to be careful um, not to ask too many questions because mm. the pilots, they are really busy and probably stressed. And okay. they just need some time to figure out what the problem is. Mm. Yeah, also they are very high uh, stress levels. Uh, person danger is very rare. Uh, for many crews that never have uh, an emergency before. And then again, a controller shouldn't give too much input at the same time because they are still trying to figure out what the problem is. And, um, but our problem, on the other hand, is that we always kind of feel helpless. So we tend to say something, mm -hmm. just want to say something. So, but actually the priority is that the pilot flies the, the plane safely. Mm. Anything else in? Uh, and time goes very quickly in the cockpit. Uh, the pilots feel as they have uh, very many things to do. Mm. But it's, it's time. But this time is actually very short. Mm. For us it's the other way around. Mm. So we really have to wait a long time. And then, um, yeah, we just mainly wait for information from the pilots. So for us, the time seems to be longer. And um, yeah, whereas the pilots might be running out of time. Communication with air traffic controller mm. is not very important. <laughs> the most important thing is to keep flying mm. the aircraft. So in um, just in case there is no communication, the controller needs to stay calm and wait and just monitor the aircraft. And of course, um, the controller also needs to tell their supervisors that there is an emergency and not only concentrate on this um, specific aircraft, but also on other aircrafts which might be in danger. And some pilots uh, don't, don't want to say it's a serious problem. And maybe they do not want to say it is an emergency, really when it's an emergency. Mm. Uh, the pilots can shoot very cold and calm when really it's, it, it is not like that at all on the flight deck. Okay. Um, any other information? Yeah, maybe just that sometimes controllers um, seem to forget that um, yeah, just to warn other aircraft because mm. they only concentrate on this one aircraft which is in, in an emergency case. Yeah. Mm. And uh, language difficulties are made worse because mm. uh, in emergency situation they can't speak 
other language, even their own language, usually they can't yeah, speak. That's true. Yeah. It's hard. Okay, thank you, Bianca. Thank you, In. That's the yes. end of the test. Thank you. In task one, the interlocutor interviews the candidates using verbal questions and other elicitation prompts based on familiar aviation environments, operations and topic frames. Candidates speak a little about themselves and are given the opportunity to discuss topics related to their areas of aviation operations. A candidate is encouraged to interact both with the interlocutor and his or her fellow candidate. Candidates are expected to respond to the interlocutor's questions and to listen to what their partner has to say, joining the interaction as appropriate. There is interlocutor flexibility in the use of high-end ICAO language proficiency rating scale discriminators. Five to six minutes is allowed for the completion of this task. OK, let's begin. So, good morning. My name morning. is Alison Gass and this is my colleague, Howard Alexander. Good morning. So, can we begin by confirming your first names, please? My name is Bianca. And my name is Ian. Thank you. So, as we speak, please remember that at any time you can ask me or each other to confirm, clarify or give further information. So, you will not lose marks for asking questions throughout the test. So, in this first task, I'd like to learn something about you and your job. So, Bianca, if I can begin with you, what's your job and where do you work? I am an air traffic controller. I work for the um, national air navigation service provider of my state. At the moment I work in the tower of a rather small regional airport where I have a combined ground tower and procedural approach function. Okay, thank you. Um, and in, what's your job and where do you work? Uh, I'm a commissioner airline pilot. Uh, I trained in the UK before uh, learning returning home and now I'm currently a first officer uh, flying for a small airline operator in my country. I fly domestic and short uh, short haul international fly, flight to various uh, countries in Southeast Asia. Okay, thank you. So Bianca, you say that you work for a small regional airport. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a bit more about your airport and its operations? Um, we have a runway 05 and runway 23 and the runway length is approximately 2,700 meters but it's just under 50 meters wide and uh, runway 23 has ILS category 1 but recently ILS category 2 has been installed and yeah we really do like it and um, we have domestic and international traffic so I think maybe 20 or 30 scheduled flights a day. Okay. Yeah, may I ask a question? Yes, please do. Uh, do you have any charter flights? Um, yes, we do. We do have charter flights and they come with the season. Um, in the winter, we don't have so many. In the summer, because the region is a tourist region, we have a lot more. Let's say maybe 20 or 30 flights in the week, but more at the weekend times. Do you have any other general aviation traffic? Yes, we have. We have a small flying club, but um, yeah, it's really small, but still it's rather active. And we have a um, flight training academy, so it's both for light aircraft and helicopters. Oh, yes, once a year we have an air show, so it's mainly um, a demonstration of military and civilian aircraft and air displays. I think it's a lot of fun for the people but it's really hard for air traffic controllers. You said you do approach control. Do you have a, a separate approach control unit? Yes, we do have a separate approach control but it does not operate 24 hours. It only operates from 6 o'clock in the morning until 8 o'clock in the evenings. And after these times we provide procedural approach service only but um, the tower controllers do this. And we have noise abatement regula regulations. Um, we don't have so many traffic movements in the night. Thank you, Bianca. So, in you fly short-haul international flights. Um, can you tell me what aircraft you fly internationally? 
Uh, when I fly internationally, I fly the Airbus A310. An A310? Yes, A310. Okay, and, and I know that before flying, pilots um, often walk around the aircraft to inspect it. Can you tell me what they are looking for when they do that check? Yeah, uh, always before flying, a pilot must carefully uh, inspect the aircraft. Uh, when I inspect my aircraft, I check, check all surfaces for uh, sign of damage. Uh, a, a plane can be damaged by a bird strike or lightning strike or any other object uh, or by service vehicle on the ground. Maybe if I have bent or, or damaged wings panels, panels uh, this can be an indication of damage to the airframe. Maybe uh, struc structural damage and this is more serious. So this check is very important before each flight. Okay, and where do you start your checks? Mm, I start at the nose and first I check the pitot system. The pitot tube gives information for the airspeed and altimeter and I check to make sure there is no obstruction. Then I check the nose on the carriage and I look for damage to the tires or for tires worn out. Uh, in the undercarriage, I check the oils to ensure compression is correct and there are no leak of fluid. Mm, then after the nose gear, I do, I do the same checks on the main, main undercarriage below, below, below the wings. I'm sorry, um, can you explain please what is oils? Oils? Yeah. I've never heard this work before. Uh, oleos, the oleos is a uh, part of on the carriage. Uh, it's it's uh, for observing the impact of the aircraft on oh, landing. Thank you, and please continue. Uh, after after on the carriage, I inspect the leading leading edge of the wings for damage, and I check the engine crawling uh, and the uh, fastenings. The look at the fan blame, uh, blades uh, I can see on the engine and I, I look for any sign of, of damage from bird strike or other objects. I check the engine exhaust and air intakes and look for obstructions. obstructions. I look at the fuselage and the tail and I do the same checks over all surfaces and I check all cargo doors or access hatches are shut and secure. Okay, Ian, thank you. Bianca, you mentioned about noise abatement regulations. Could you explain a bit more about those regulations at your airport? Mm, do you mean for the nighttime operations or for the daytime? For the daytime. Okay. Um, yeah, um, there are small towns and villages very close around the airport. So for turbojet and propeller aircraft, um, we have noise abatement procedures for continuous descent approach. Okay, please go on. Um, so we expect such an aircraft approaching the airport to confirm with our um, continuous descent approach. And this is for low power and low drag approach. And for this, we instruct aircraft to, to, to fly between, um, I think, um, 210 knots and uh, 240 knots during approach. And at 12 nautical miles, we, um, from, from touchdown, I mean, uh, we reduce aircraft speed to between 160 and, say, 180 knots and then they must maintain 160 knots from, I think, um, 8 DME to 4 DME from touchdown. And then to help with aircraft spacing, we may request exact speeds and pilots must comply with speed adjustments when we tell them. Mm -hmm. And if the pilot needs speed change, just, let's say, um, because of the aircraft performance, um, the pilot should tell us. Uh, in this system, who passes heading and flight levels or altitude? 
Um, first, by the radar controller, an aircraft will be vectored from the holding facility to um, or after transfer of control from the area control unit to our approach. When clearance to descend below the transition altitude is given, um, ATC advises pilots of the track distance to touchdown. And we try to make descent continuous with no level flight necessary. Approach control gives more information on the distance from the touchdown between this descent clearance and the instruction to turn onto the intercept heading um, for the ILS localizer. Thank you, Bianca. I'll stop you there. Um, so, In, do you like flying the A310? Yes, it's a beautiful aircraft. Uh, very nice to fly with many automatic systems. Okay, and I've heard of something called an ECAM on mm -hmm. an Airbus. Um, can you explain what an ECAM is? Yeah, ECAM. ECAM is for electronic uh, centralized uh, aircraft monitoring system. It's a system that has two flight warning computers that process data from the aircraft system systems and gives the pilot status information. It can monitor aircraft systems to give early notification of problems to the crew if anything is not normal. And if there's a problem, what happens? Uh, if there is a problem, the ECAM system generates uh, warning indications. Okay, so it tells you something is wrong? Yes, it tells you you there is a problem, mm -hmm. uh, what the problem is, and how serious the problem is. Ah, so how serious it is as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll stop you there, if I may. In task two, candidates are asked to discuss with each other in a non-face-to-face, voice-only interaction, the nature and details of a non-routine incident presented as a recorded oral prompt. The candidates listen to a short RT communication involving the development of an aviation-related non-routine incident. The communication is selected by the interlocutor to be appropriate to the context of aviation operations of the candidates. The candidates are asked to discuss with one another the details of the incident before one candidate may be nominated to present a brief, concise report in plain English if required. The candidates interact principally with each other the discussion of the RT allowing for the demonstration of both aural comprehension and discourse management strategies. The interlocutor may then ask one or two concluding questions. More than one RT communication may be played and discussed. The number of recorded prompts to be played is at the discretion of the interlocutor. Candidates are expected to share the interaction and to initiate and respond appropriately. OK, in this second task, I'd like you to talk to each other, but without seeing each other. So if you could turn your chairs back to back, please. Yes. Thank you. You'll hear a recording of an aeronautical communication. You'll hear the recording once, and you can take notes as you listen. After you've listened, I'd like you to speak to each other about the information that you've heard. So you should ask each other to check, clarify and confirm any of the details that you've heard. So once you're happy that you've got all the information, I may then ask one of you to complete a short report about what you've heard. As you discuss, you can ask me to say again any of the details that you've heard in the communication. OK, so this communication comes from after landing. You'll hear the company name Moonfleet and the ATC unit Longford Tower. Okay. Moonfleet 511, Longford Tower. You have overshot the designated exit point of the runway. Are you able to turn around? Affirm Tower. Moonfleet 511, making a 180. Roger, Moonfleet 511. Please expedite turn and report when complete. at all. That's the first part. Okay. Okay, so please begin your discussions. Longford Tower is speaking to, I think, Moonfleet 511. Bianca, can you confirm the call sign? 
affirm Moonfleet 511. That's what I have. And Longford Tower advises uh, Moonfleet 511 that they have overgone the runway point. Yes, um, that they have overshot, I think, the designated exit point of the runway. And Tower asked Moonfleet 511 if they are able to turn round. Uh, Moonfleet 511 uh, confirmed the requ request and the report making a 180. This is a 180 degree turn, like a U turn on, on the runway. And the tower requests that Moonfleet 511 expedites their turn and reports back to the tower when the turn is complete. Yes, I understand the same. Expedite the report to the tower. Okay, thank you. Is there anything else either of you would like to add? No. no. Okay, the same situation continues. 180 complete, Moonfleet 511. Roger, Moonfleet 511. Continue ahead 100 metres approximately and then vacate runway via the exit to your right. Taxiway Charlie Tree. Roger Tower, exit in sight and welcome, Moonfleet 511. Okay, please begin your discussion. Bianca, could you start this time, please? Moonfleet 511 reports turn complete and the tower instructs to continue straight ahead approximately um, 100 metres and then Moonfleet 511 must vacate the runway via exit. She said left or right, but, but I'm not sure. And taxiway Charlie 3. I heard exit, exit to the right, maybe but I'm not sure. Um, please say again, exit. Vacate runway via exit to your right. The controller instructs the pilot to continue ahead 100 meters and vacate runway via exit on the right. Taxiway Charlie 3. Okay, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I think uh, Bianca has, uh, has said everything. Okay, now in. Could you make a brief report of the communication? You have up to one minute. Uh, Longford Tower advises Moonfleet 511 uh, that he has passed the correct runway exit point and instructs uh, him to turn around on the runway to backtrack. Uh, the pilot reports when the turn is complete and the controller instructs him to continue for 100 meters and take the exit on the right. Thank you. Bianca, do you have anything else to add? Um, only it was exit onto taxiway Charlie 3. Oh yes, sorry, I have that. Exit to taxiway Charlie 3. Yes, taxiway Charlie 3. Okay, thank you. Now please turn your seats back to face me. Yep. In task three, each candidate is asked to prepare a speaking turn of up to two minutes duration on a specific scenario of an unusual circumstance or emergency situation selected by the interlocutor. The scenario is customized and set within the candidate's own operational context. To help them structure their speaking turn, candidates are provided with a card listing a series of generalized prompts. Although the scenarios given to the candidates are not the same, the prompt card for all candidates lists the same four prompts. In their speaking turns, candidates should attempt to address each of the prompts in relation to their given scenario. OK, in this third task, I'm going to give you each a scenario about an unusual circumstance or emergency situation. I'd like you to consider the scenario and speak for about two minutes about what can happen. Your responses should follow the prompts on these cards. So, Bianca, your scenario is that a twin-engined commercial airliner on approach to your airport reports unsafe indication in its landing gear. And in your scenario is that your aircraft in level flight at flight level 250 experiences a sudden loss of pressurisation. Okay, do you both understand your scenarios? Yes. yes. Okay, so you have one minute to prepare your responses. The prompt card helps the candidates to structure their speaking turns. They are advised that their task response 
should include consideration of the following. The nature of the scenario given, possible pilot communications, information requirements and actions, possible controller communications, information requirements and actions, further communications and actions that may be required, such as coordination with other aircraft on station, coordination with other aircraft in vicinity, coordination with adjacent sectors, requests for assistance of other agencies, and coordination with aircraft company. After the candidate's one-minute preparation time, the interlocutor nominates one of the candidates to begin the speaking turn. Each candidate speaks for up to two minutes on their particular scenario, during which time neither the interlocutor nor the listening candidate interrupts. At the end of the speaking turn, the listening candidate is invited to ask questions about the discourse given. The interlocutor may then ask one or two concluding questions. Once again, there is interlocutor flexibility in the use of high-end ICAO language proficiency rating scale discriminators. All right, Ian, um, I'd like you to go first. Uh, what's your scenario? Uh, my aircraft has a sudden loss of pressure at flight level 250. Okay, thank you. Bianca, I'd like you to listen to In, and when he's finished speaking, ask him a question about something specific he has said. Mm -hmm. So, In, I'd like you to speak to Bianca for about two minutes about your scenario. When my aircraft uh, experiences a sudden loss of pressure at flight level 250, it's an emergency situation. Uh, you cannot breathe the air at flight level 250 because there is not enough oxygen and it is immediately necessary to descend to an altitude where you can breathe the air. Maybe 10,000 feet or whatever is the minimum safe altitude. Depending if I know about damage to the aircraft or the problem, I will an annoyance pen call or mayday call, usually mayday. In the Mayday call, I will state Mayday, 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 then the, then the name of the control station and my call sign. I say emergency descent due to lot of uh, pressure and give the intention of the captain. This is Mayday, a diversion and emergency landing or continue flight to plant destination at the safe, at the safe altitude. I change my squawk to 7700. Uh, this is an emergency squawk, so people, people know that I have a problem. It may be possible that I must descend without warning and without communication to quickly, to quickly descend the aircraft to a safe altitude and that there is no time to reset to the emergency squawk. Also, if I have the oxygen mask on in the cockpit, this can make a problem with the RT. After the emergency descent, I, I con contact the air traffic control unit and tell them my position, my new flight level and my heading. Also, ATC will want to know how many people I have on the aircraft, my POB. Uh, the controller will acknowledge the mayday, but maybe he has already seen the descent on the radar. He will take all necessary action to maintain s separation and will tell aircraft is in area of my craft in emergency descent. He may suggest a heading and tell me the minimum safe altitude. He will maintain se separation and give me any essential traffic information. Um, maybe he will make an emergency broadcast to traffic on his station. After the emergency descent, he, he asks my intentions. Uh, if I want to diversion, uh, if I have injuries on board, if the aircraft is damaged, he will inform other sectors, all sectors and control units to my destination airport and ATC considers my aircraft 
aircraft in an emergency situation until I land. Also, I or controller informs my company of the problem. Thank you, In. Bianca, could you ask In your question? Yeah, um, In, for your emergency descent, do you descend on the same heading? If I can, I will turn away from my track before I begin the emergency descent because there is a problem with uh, other aircraft below me and separation. Uh, also, I turn on the aircraft uh, lights so other aircraft can see me and uh, I watch for conflicting uh, traffic as I descend and with T cars. Mm -hmm. Yes, when we have an aircraft in emergency descent, our instruction is to always try to clear the um, airspace below the descending aircraft. For safety. Yes, for safety. Also, we know there is a problem with not enough oxygen and that this makes the pilot confused or maybe he will be a little bit slow or will not follow our instructions when we tell them. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you, In. Uh, now, Bianca, what is your scenario, please? My scenario is that an aircraft on approach to my airport um, reports an unsafe indication with its landing gear. OK, so, In, I'd like you to listen to Bianca. Yeah. When she's finished, um, I'd like you to ask her a question about something specific that she has said. So, Bianca, could you speak to In for about two minutes um, about your scenario? So, if an aircraft on approach reports unsafe indication of landing gear, this can be a problem with the landing gear extension, and then probably the aircraft will not want to land immediately. It's an urgency situation, but it's not an emergency situation at the beginning, um, I mean, right from the start. And I don't think that um, the pilot will make a mayday. The pilot informs ATC maybe approach, maybe tower control, that there is a problem and I ask, what are your intentions? The pilot may request proceed to holding area in order to carry out checks. And I will give them necessary instructions and clearances. If the pilot sees the problem on final approach, minimum is a go around. Already I'm thinking about restricting the use of the runway by other aircraft until I know what is happening and informing other aircraft in approach that there is a problem. If the pilot cannot find the answer to the problem, then maybe he will request a visual inspection. So he says maybe landing gear down but maybe not locked. Or, and I ask him again his intentions and he says we intend to make a low pass near the tower to have the undercarriage checked. I give him instructions for his low pass. Maybe make a low pass at 200 feet runway heading north of the tower. The aircraft makes the low pass and we see the landing gear. We cannot say the landing gear is okay. We can only say your landing gear seems to be completely extended. Then the pilot must decide his action and inform us of his intentions. So he says, request emergency services and we intend to land. Then I instruct him in his final approach and landing. I clear the runway. Also, I check that towing equipment is on standby. Um, the aircraft may have reduced braking capability and I make sure the safety strip is clear. When the aircraft lands, there is the possibility that the undercarriage collapses or that the aircraft loses directional control. More damage can occur if a tire bursts um, when the aircraft lands and also there is then the possibility of a fuel leak. We must just watch the situation and evacuate the aircraft as soon as possible. And yeah, of course, at the start of the emergency, I inform my supervisor and alert um, airport emergency service. If the pilot asks me, I will inform his company. Um, maybe he will want to speak to an engineer. Thank you, Bianca. In, could you ask Bianca your question? 
Uh, Bianca, it's a, it's a low pass near the tower, the only way to have uh, visual inspection. No, there's also the possibility for a visual inspection um, from another aircraft. We can maybe call a search and rescue helicopter um, and ask them to take position where they can see into the aircraft um, or if there is another aircraft in this area. Yeah, th this is possible. Mm -hmm. And if an aircraft cannot extend the landing gear, what can happen? If the landing gear is not down at all, then we prepare the one way for a belly landing. Um, clear all aircraft from the runway, all emergency services, ambulance and fire service. We have crash foam and, um, and then it is, yeah, it really is an emergency. Okay, thank you Bianca, thank you Ian. At the end of the e out test of speaking, candidates are thanked for attending but are given no indication of their level of achievement. The recording of the interview is forwarded to EALT Central Administration for further external assessment. All evidence of language proficiency gathered in the course of the EALT, both from the EALT test of listening and the EALT test of speaking, is collated before a final moderation takes place and ICAO ratings are awarded. The CAA International EALTs, testing with authority.